Buenas noches, muchas gracias por, por, uh, por unirnos esta noche uh, con la charla con el doctor Fundakowski. Uh, para todos los que están, los médicos que están entrando, hay una pestañita de interpretación que está justo debajo de la pantalla. Pueden darle clic ahí. Eh, vamos a estar hablando en inglés y en español, pero para que, que puedan mantener toda la charla ustedes escuchándola en español, por favor denle, denle clic ahí para cambiar al canal de español. Muchas gracias por, por, por su presencia. Mi nombre es Arturo Aceves. I am the, I'm going to switch now to English. I am the director for international business development at Philadelphia International Medicine. I'm going to share my screen real quick over here. There you go. So housekeeping, what I, what I mentioned, you're going to have this tab at the bottom of the screen. Click on Interpretación, and you're going to be able to switch to Spanish, okay? Now, give me one second. So Philadelphia International Medicine is a company uh, that is owned and is operated by the 10 of the best healthcare systems here in the area of Philadelphia. Uh, of those 10 healthcare systems, three own the company. One is Jefferson Health, the other one is Fox Chase Cancer Center, and the other one is Temple Health. What we do uh, is basically three things. The first one is do we do clinical treatment for international patients. We provide a concierge services for patients coming from different parts of the world. We have had patients coming from Saudi, Qatar, Emirates, uh, China, all over Europe, Mexico. We have patients coming from Colombia. So our mission is, is to be able to provide those services to international patients through uh, discounts, through helping them to find the place where to stay, to helping them to find um, how to be able to come to the States and navigate the healthcare system here that sometimes is not that easy. The second thing that we do has to do with medical education, um, something like this. We do a lot of webinars, we do a lot of, um, we travel with our physicians to different countries to participate in, in conferences, In congresses. So we have uh, last year we were traveling, we were remembering this just before uh, we started. Uh, we were traveling with Dr. Fundakowski to the Dominican Republic and we're very looking forward next year. Hopefully all things with COVID are controlled. We can go to, to Cali and to, and to Bogota. So these medical education programs also include the possibility of visiting physicians here in our institutions. Um, You can come here and we facilitate the opportunity for observanceships in different specialties that we cover all of them from um, high risk pregnancy to lung cancer, transplant, obviously otorhinolaryngology, um, neurology, all type of treatment, all type of uh, um, training, I'm sorry. And the other thing that we do is consulting services. We have different agreements with institutions around the world, China, Europe, um, uh, in, in the Gulf, uh, in the Middle East, to do to develop centers of excellence, to develop trainings, to develop education, not only for um, clinical personnel, but also for administrative personnel. So we do all of this and all of this exists, as I told you, in this environment where we have technical care systems. Uh, we have two medical schools, we have two masters in healthcare administration, to nursing schools and to national cancer, cancer institutes, which are in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is known as the city of ETS and METS, education and medicine. Six out of 10 physicians in the United States at some point in their life received training here in Philadelphia because we have seven medical schools, we have 100, over 100 hospitals and over 100 universities. The first place in the US where a hospital existed was here, the first cancer dedicated hospital was um, was built in here. So we're very happy to be able to have this type of interactions. Our goal is to be able to connect with physicians in Latin America. Um, myself as a Mexican and somebody who, who lived in Bogota for almost six, year, six years, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to facilitate this, this, um, <clears throat> these academic events. So now, I want to take the opportunity to obviously thank Dr. Adriana Birne uh, for joining us tonight. She's the president of the head and neck uh, chapter at the Colombian Otorrinolaryngology Association. Uh, also Dr. Felix Parales, uh, who has been 
and uh, the greatest help. Uh, he's our ally in Colombia. We're very happy to be able to collaborate with him. He works at Clinica Veramicana in Barranquilla, uh, which belongs to Organización Sanitas. And obviously, we want to take the time to thank Asociación Colombiana de Otorrinolaringología, Cirugía de Cabeza y Cuello, Maxilofacial y Estética Facial, for all their support. Uh, thanks to, to you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We are expecting to have a very good conversation, and we see this as the first step of having many more int uh, interactions together. So now I'm going to leave the floor to Doctora Obirne. Bueno, muy buenas noches a todos. Muy buenas noches, a Arturo, Doctor Kundakowski, Doctor Parales, a toda la audiencia. Eh, bienvenidos. Quiero presentar a, a nuestro invitado hoy, el doctor Christopher Fundakowski, es un otolaringólogo, otolaringólogo especialista eh, que trabaja en Filadelfia, Pensilvania. Él se graduó con honores del Rush Medical College de la Universidad Rush. El doctor Fundakowski completó su residencia en la Universidad de Miami, en el Jackson Memorial Hospital, y hizo su fellowship en Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Tiene más de 12 años de experiencia y uh, en diversos campos y ahora está afiliado con el Abington Memorial Hospital del Jefferson Health. Actualmente es un profesor asociado de otorrinolaringología y cirugía de cabeza y cuello en la Thomas Jefferson University. Entre sus múltiples logros, el doctor Fundakowski tiene el de haber sido el primer cirujano en realizar una tiroidectomía robótica transoral en Filadelfia lo cual me parece muy interesante. Sus intereses científicos y eh, su experticia son en cirugía de cabeza y cuello, cáncer sin una sal, cáncer de tiroides, tumores de glándulas salivares y cáncer orofaringeo. Bienvenido, doctor Fundakowski. Welcome. Tenemos, we also have Dr. Parales. Thank you, doctor, for joining us tonight. Buenas noches, muchas gracias. Hello, Christopher. Thank you for joining for the lecture and you're welcome. You want me to get started? Yes, sir. I keep telling them to add hair to that picture, but they never do. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move this out of the way. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, for having me and I hope everybody is at home and safe. And this is a, a new um, way of doing this for all of us, but if there, you know, hopefully we have a good conversation at the end of this. Um, so my name is Chris Bundarkowski. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, from Jefferson. And you know, my topic that I chose to talk on is sentinel node biopsy. And I think this is relevant for surgeons specifically because we've, now is this era of personalization in medicine and we hear so much about immunotherapy and tailoring uh, treatments to the patient, but the surgeons somewhat feel like they're left out of this. And so I think this is our, our opportunity to take unique features of the patient's presentation and staging and tumors and, and tailor the operation even more specifically than we have in the past. And so I think there's a lot of things changing uh, in this area. Um, and I wanted to give some updates on it. Doctor, uh, would you mind to share your screen? Share again? Yes, we're gonna see it. Did that do it? Yes, sir. Thank Is you. that working? Yes, sir. Good. Looking good. Okay. Okay. I have no disclosures. Um, so this was an example of a case that I thought was relevant that we had recently. This was a 55-year-old gentleman, severe alcohol history, uh, presenting with a 1.5-centimeter lateral oral tongue lesion with clinical suspected depth of about six millimeters um, and clinically and radiographically N0 and uh, biopsy noting moderately differentiated squamous carcinoma and 
um, based on based on eighth edition staging, this would put him as a, a C T two N zero M zero stage two, and so you know, we talk about what are some of the uh, options for this patient, and we basically have three groups of options here: partial glossectomy with observation of the neck versus partial glossectomy with elective neck dissection versus glossectomy with sentinel node biopsy. And so, you know, there are arguments for each uh, of these options, though there's data that supports some as being better than others, and I'll go over uh, the details of each one of those. Um, in the talk, we'll talk about some of the background of sentinel node biopsy and, and where it's come from and where it's going and how you pick the right patients, um, some of the details on the techniques and some of the you know, operative pearls to make this easier, and some of the uh, places you have to be careful. And then we'll talk about some of the ongoing trials. So I try to throw up one statistic that I, I want everybody to remember, and, and it's 70%. And so 70% is the number of elective neck dissections uh, that you can eliminate for uh, all comers, uh, early stage oral cavity cancer that present uh, for surgical treatment. And so I include a picture of my two-year-old and this is how upset you're going to be when you realize you could have avoided all this surgery. <clears throat> and so when we talk about sentinel node biopsy, um, this is not a treatment, it's, it's, a, it's a surgical staging tool and it provides you extremely important information. And we know that neck staging is critical. Uh, and you can see here on the uh, y-axis um, our, let me move this box here. Uh, you see here on the y-axis is the survival, x-axis is uh, time. And we know that five-year uh, N0, uh, T, you know, T, T you know, one through four, N0, all comers uh, will give you, you know, low 80%. Uh, survival, but as you add one node and become stage three, this drops by you know twenty percent. And as you add two nodes, making you stage four, uh, <clears throat> is drops you into uh, below sixty. And so that we know as a cohort, N positive patients end up being uh, around fifty percent five year survival. So you need to know what's going on in the lymph nodes uh, to prognosticate these patients. <clears throat> And so how do we stage them and how do we get this information and what are these options? And so we talked the first one about watching and waiting on the neck. Um, can you image them? You know, CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, PET scan. Um, we know that if you watch and wait the patients, about 25% are gonna have regional nodal failure. Uh, and if this happens and you uh, surgically salvage them, you will still have inferior overall survival and disease-free survival. Um, this option may present with uh, increased cost overall, um, and not every patient, when they do fail regionally, will be surgically salvageable. And the second group would be those who undergo elective uh, unilateral or bilateral neck dissection, typically levels one through three or four. And you know, there's various, um, data on the degree of shoulder dysfunction, but as a whole, it ends up being close to over you know, 20 percent of patients will have some type of impact of the shoulder. Um, there's neurophysiologic data showing that 360-ing the accessory nerve will present with permanent uh, neurophysiologic changes, um, regardless of whether or not you think you injured it or not, just by devascularizing it. Um, Kyle leak is not a large issue. Um, or that common, but it does happen and something to consider, which is extremely uncommon in sentinel node biopsy. And stroke is also single digit percentages, um, but when presenting elderly patients with bilateral neck dissection, this does become um, a significant issue in terms of risk. So sentinel node biopsy um, has improved sensitivity over imaging and isolation um, and has comparatively decreased operative morbidity. Um, and so this is a potential benefit of undergoing this approach. So how do you pick which are the, the ones that are going to be high risk for regional metastasis and may not benefit from sentinel node? These are the high T stage, T3, T4, we are talking 
greater than 20% likelihood of being positive to begin with. Uh, these likely benefit from uh, elective neck up front because the rate of uh, positivity on the sentinel node would be very high to begin with. Um, depth of invasion. Um, what depth would be so high that sentinel node biopsy may not make sense? Likely as you get over 10, uh, because that's going to place you in uh, stage three anyway. Um, and then subsite locations, which region in the oral cavity is going to pose higher versus lower rates of occult metastasis, and how are you going to factor that into your decision making? So this is a paper which is now five years old, which is amazing. The time has flied like this. Um, but, but this is a, a, a sentinel paper that came out uh, in the New England Journal um, from Tata. It was almost 600 patients, uh, early stage of oral cavity cancer, uh, prospective randomized control trial um, with two groups. One uh, group undergoing elective nodal dissection versus a second group undergoing uh, therapeutic dissection uh, when uh, identified with um, regional failure. And post-operative adjuvant radiation was given for those with uh, N-positive and, and very high depth of invasion or positive margins. And the overall uh, endpoints of this study were overall survival and disease-free survival. And if you look here at the uh, upper left table, uh, this is the overall survival. And on the upper right, this is the disease-free survival. And the blue lines are those who went upfront elective neck dissection. And the red lines are those who, when they failed regionally, underwent uh, salvage or therapeutic dissection. And you can see that the curves are not the same. And there is um, overall difference in survival um, and disease-free survival by electing to observe the neck until it fails. Now, there were many different factors that they looked at from a clinical standpoint with the study, but we talk a lot about tumor depth. And in their uh, subcategorization, they saw that patients with tumor depths of three millimeters or less uh, did not benefit from elective surgery on the front end. Um, but when you talk about getting over three, three millimeters or, or four plus millimeters in depth, um, those patients uh, were better served with upfront neck dissection. Or, <clears throat> and so when you look at the bottom here, um, the average node positivity with a depth of invasion of three millimeters is 5%. And as you increase by one millimeter, this is fourfold greater. So 17%. Uh, and so you can see the problem with this is these are both T1 patients. And so within this uh, single uh, T stage group, you have two dramatically different uh, likelihoods of nodal positivity, all uh, by one millimeter. And so that's when we when you're using some degree of subjectivity to feel how deep this is and saying, well, maybe I don't need to look at the lymph nodes. Uh, if you're off by a millimeter, that risk may be 17% and not less than 5%. So why do we use this? Um, we know that the diagnostic testing in terms of imaging um, is, it cannot detect occult metastasis with sufficient accuracy. So we need something uh, better. Uh, we know that in terms of treatment, um, sentinel node biopsy has comparative morbidity uh, to elective neck dissection. Uh, in terms of pathologic benefit, um, we know that the drainage patterns are not always predictable. And I'll show you some really interesting and kind of scary data that talks about contralateral uh, drainage that we may not always consider. Um, and the other thing is standard nodal assessment in terms of elective neck dissections may miss micrometastasis, and this may have uh, prognostic relevance too. And then cost, you know, this is a smaller factor, but this may be uh, a less expensive approach uh, than watching or waiting uh, uh, or elective neck dissection. And so um, a lot of this data comes from Europe uh, where this has been going on for, you know, over 10 years now. And so joint practice guidelines came out in 2009. Um, and so you can see that Based on uh, these guidelines, Sentinel node is a diagnostic test. It is a staging tool. It is not a form of treatment. And how does it work? So the right patient is a T1, T2 oral cavity patient. Um, they undergo a four quadrant peritumoral injection with either technetium 99, lymphozeek, and typically is one millicurie if you're doing it the day of surgery, two millicurie if you're doing it the evening before. Uh, 
um, they undergo imaging uh, prior to the OR. And this could take uh, typically around two hours, either planar lymphocentigraphy or a CT SPECT. And I'll go over the differences of those two imaging uh, modalities in a second. Uh, once they're in the OR, um, gamma probe identification, an option of a co-localizer. So methylene blue versus indocyanine green. Um, I use a lot of ICG, uh, ICG dye now. I don't use methylene blue anymore. I'll, I'll go over why and why I think the dye is better. And then the pathologic assessment is different. There's step sectioning, there's use of immunohistochemistry, um, which is a little bit more in depth than the standard uh, bivalving of uh, the node specimen in the neck dissection. And so 2010 um, in JCO, this was a multi-center trial that went on in the US looking at uh, about 150 patients from 25 institutions. And this was going on when I was at Miami. And we would take early stage oral cavity cancers and you would do the sentinel node biopsy on it. And then you would do an neck dissection at the same time. So you could get your true predictive values from that patient. And what was seen is that the negative predictive value was 96%. True positive rate was just over 20%, which is what to be expected for this T1, T2 cohort. And the false negative rate was just under 10%. Um, and now in this study, though, the, all four false negatives occurred in low experience surgeons. And this goes into the discussion of how important um, the learning curve is in missing the positive nodes on these types of patients. And when you see of the 140 neck dissections that occurred, 100 of them could have been avoided uh, given the fact that the sound nodes were negative. <clears throat> now, how do you pick the right patient? So you start with clinical staging and they need to be N0 with, uh, you know, clinically as well as with some type of preoperative imaging, CT, ultrasound, MRI, whatever you're comfortable with. And initially it, you'd think that it would make sense to perform this on a sicker patient because it's a smaller procedure, uh, but you need to think that if you are approaching a 20 to 25% chance of this node being positive, if you're picking the right patients, um, an elderly or sick patient who is plus or minus on blood thinners you know, may not be the right patient because there's a 25% chance they're going to have to go back to the OR for a completion neck dissection. So typically the sicker patients, uh, even if their tumor does have good characteristics for this, I'll typically take them up front for an elective neck dissection so it can avoid two rounds of anesthesia if they're a high risk from that standpoint. Um, previous uh, neck surgery or radiation. Um, these patients can still undergo sentinel node biopsy, and this may actually be benefit because there may be discordant uh, drainage patterns that have developed as a result of that previous treatment. And then also depth of invasion shouldn't be used in, in isolation uh, to decide, um, but ideally the depth of invasion should be greater than three millimeters because less than three millimeters, the chance of it being positive is under 5%. And so if you look at the NCCN guidelines, um, you know, sentinel node biopsy is built into this, uh, mostly in this center uh, row here where you take an early stage raw cavity patient, they undergo sentinel node biopsy. If you are unable to find it uh, by, you know, something went wrong in the OR or you're not comfortable, doing a neck dissection at that time is the right answer. Um, if you find the sentinel node and it's negative, um, then you're able to um, watch the patient. If the node is positive, um, consideration of radiation um, with tumor board eval. Now, how do you do the injection? So typically four quadrant injection um, around the tumor. Um, most of the time, some type of topical anesthesia will help the patient with the pain. Um, I said, if you know, we're doing this the morning of, it's typically one millicurie of lymphoseq or technetium in a half a cc, uh, or if it's the day before, typically the dose is double. And so then how does technetium-99 silver sulfur uh, differ from tomanicept or lymphoseq? And so the big difference here is that tomanicept is, uh, has a particular target for CD206, and this is a protein that's found in dendritic cells in the lymph nodes. And so this, in theory, I, uh, concentrates the, uh, the uh, tracer in the lymph node uh, to a greater extent. 
And so it will clear faster from the injection site and it will stick uh, for a longer period of time in the first node. And so the potential benefit of that is there's less shine through from the injection site, um, but also instead it doesn't uh, pass through as fast. And so you can end up having less sentinel nodes uh, beyond the, the primary. So you can see in the cohorts that use Tilmanicept typically average one to two sentinel nodes versus uh, three to four using uh, technetium 99 uh, sulfur colon. I think both still work fine. Now, in terms of imaging, lymphocentigraphy. So the two main options are coplanar uh, lymphocentigraphy versus CT spect. Um, you can see the two types of pictures, planar versus CT spect. Without any of this information on the left, everybody would likely agree which picture they would rather have uh, just inherently by looking at which one you'd want to operate off of. Um, now, when you look deeper to it, the, the, the drawback of the planar is that you only really have 2D. And the, big, the bigger drawback is looking at lesions uh, and, and nodal drainage that is in close proximity to the injection site. And if you compare these two patients, you can see that there is a large amount of injection uh, uptake here. And it's identifying the ipsilateral 1B node here, um, but it doesn't see this contralateral node because of uh, the amount of shine through. And so this is a potential uh, false negative if you don't see this. Now, when you're using CT spect, 20% of the time you'll identify an additional lymph node. And in those situations, 20% uh, of those, it will be the only positive node. So this is critical in reducing the false negatives. And you know, I would say with time and experience, you can get away with the planar, but if this is available, like I said, you can see it's night and day in terms of having a better picture to work with. <clears throat> this is another example showing the amount of uh, shine through from the primary site injection and you catching one of the ipsilateral nodes, but this second uh, perifacial node uh, you can't tell that it's there. And this would be a very difficult one to just catch with the gamma probe uh, in isolation because of the amount of uh, uptake from the injection site. Mm -hmm. So intraoperatively, how do you do this? So we talked about um, once you did the, the uh, radio injection, you did the imaging and now you're in the OR, um, some type of co-localizer is helpful. And so methylene blue is very common. I used to use this. Um, one of the concerns is with anaphylaxis, um, there has been no report uh, of anaphylaxis ever with greater than one uh, milliliter of 1% methylene blue. So I had always typically used 1%, uh, one milliliter. Um, I started using indocyanin green a couple of years ago, and uh, I use that exclusively as the co-localizer now instead of the methylene blue, because you'll only see the methylene blue if you're looking at the lymph node. With the ICG dye and the camera, it has five to six millimeters of tissue penetration. So you can actually see the lymph node on the camera before you can physically see the lymph node with your eyes. So once you inject uh, the tracer or the co-localizer, you wait 10 to 15 minutes uh, and you can do your, your gamma probe assessment and pick your incisions uh, in that meantime. And then there hasn't been um, any major change in terms of the 10% rule with the gamma probe. So you find the hottest node, um, if it is a thousand, for example, uh, you want to keep looking and removing any you know, lymph nodes that have an uptake greater than 10% of that. And once the, the basin is you know, less than 10% of the hottest, uh, then you're done. Um, typically, there's no drain uh, in these cases. They usually go home same day and the lymph nodes are sent for sentinel node protocol. And so this would be how this would work. You would inject in the upper left around the tumor and part of the problem with the injection is it's, it's a mess. And so it stains everything. And so in terms of picking your margins, um, sometimes it's difficult to, to see uh, how things are, are separating with the cautery because of the color change. And so sometimes you do really need to rely on the measurements uh, that are made uh, ahead of time to make sure you're far enough away and make sure that you're happy with the, the margins. So you'll pick your, you'll identify your, your lymph nodes based on the gamma probe, pick your incision so you can get to where you need to go. If you need multiple incisions, that's fine. And then once I find the node, this is an example of what the methylene blue looks like 
And so you can have nodes where sometimes it's one little spot of blue, sometimes the whole thing is blue, it just depends. And then typically when I'll have the node out, I'll have it sitting on top of here as opposed to upside down. And this way I know that the node is not moving and the, the count is, is more consistent, at least in my hands. So going back to this same patient that we talked to or talked about initially, um, this is the one where we, we had <clears throat> the, the lympho. We found two lymph nodes on the ipsilateral side on the imaging and injected with one milliliter of 2.5 milligram ICG dye. So this is green instead of blue. And then 15 minutes later and opening up the neck uh, in the site where the gamma probe had uptake. This is on the left with the camera off. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle here. And you turn the camera on and you can see the lymph node light up completely through the muscle without any dissection on it. Um, which is every time I see this, it's it it's still incredible. Uh, and so then you take what you found on the gamma probe, where the green light is, and then this is now the picture. You roll the sternocleidomastoid uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle back. This is your lymph node here. You put the camera on it again, and you can see it lights up uh, bright green. You take it out, and then that's your node. And so I found this to be. Uh, extremely helpful and, and at least in my hands, superior to the methylene blue co-localization. Co um, and so there's different filters on the camera. And so this is the near infrared. And so on the left of the screen was the, the basin of the first lymph node. And as you shine the near infrared, you find that there's a second node that lights up um, behind the IJ. And then as we open the sheath here, shine the light and you can see uh, the second node is here behind the, the vein. <clears throat> and so in terms of the pathology, so the assessment is a little bit different. So there's step sectioning that occurs in the lymph node and then they're split into pairs where half of them are, or one of the pair is H and E stained uh, and the second of the pair gets the uh, IHC stain. And so this allows you to catch, you know, micrometastasis uh, that you may not catch with the standard processing. And so as far as the technique, you know, this is very operator dependent. And so learning curve is typically reported around 30 cases. Uh, and there's a wide range of sensitivity from, you know, 70 to hundred percent. And the false negative rate can be, you know, under 5% to over 30%. Uh, the important thing to, to yield from this very high false negative percent is that only half of the patient's who are false negative can be salvaged surgically. So missing a lymph node uh, is a really big deal um, if you can't salvage the patient surgically at the end of the day. And so the ICG um, I found, especially for floral mouth or um, you know, lesions where you think the nodal basin and perifacial 1A, 1B is gonna be nearby, uh, this is very nice because it gives you an extra um, way to identify the lymph nodes if the shine through from the gamma probe is too hot. And so how does the ICG dye work? Uh, this is not really new. This has been used by ophthalmology for a very long time. Um, breast colleagues and you know, gynonc colleagues use this. And this is uh, visualized using uh, near infrared. And ICG dye is water soluble and it binds to albumin. And so Albumin has high content in lymphatic pathways, and that's why this works. And so the reason why this picture can be so beautiful is that it's unique in that it's not just fluorescent, but it uses two different wavelengths. It has an illumination wavelength, and it has a recording wavelength. And because they're different, that allows the resolution to be so great. And so this is just another example of ICG dye used for a melanoma on an ear. And this, you know, ears and preauricular and um, periparotid skin cancers are very difficult because the injection site and the basin of drainage, everything is too hot. And so it's very hard to identify uh, what is background from the resection site versus the parotid bed. And so this provides a very easy way uh, to identify the lymph node uh, in a region where the gamma probe is just screaming too loud because of the injection. 
And so what other options are there besides methylene blue, besides ICG, uh, lymphoseq? Um, so there's a phase two non-randomized trial going on right now um, using penitimumumab. And um, what it's doing is comparing uh, sentinel node biopsy, um, neck dissection um, in patients with head and neck cancer. And so what this uh, monoclonal antibody does is it is it's an EGFR receptor antibody, which is similar to cetuximab, except it's a, uh, instead of being a chimeric monoclonal IgG1 antibody, it's a fully human monoclonal antibody. And so the benefit of this is the affinity for the EGFR receptor can be stronger. It has less infusion reaction and less ADCC. And the goal of this study is to see how can you more selectively fix this headphone. How can you more selectively um, identify the positive lymph nodes as opposed to using a, a, a CD6, a CD206 receptor from LymphoSeq or just using albumin as a surrogate? Um, does having an EGFR linked uh, antibody uh, to identify those uh, micro and macro metastasis, is that going to be better? This is another option. Uh, which I've seen reported, but I have not personally used, and this is non-radio isotope localization. And so the idea is that you would inject iodinated contrast around the tumor and then perform a CAT scan. And then, you know, if things worked well, you would see this lymph node and then they could do a, you know, 3D reconstruction. This is another option uh, using silica nanoparticles. And so the idea here is, um, is this uh, able to uh, tag the, the lymph node better uh, than a CD206 receptor. And so this is an example of an injection of the uh, nanoparticle into the tumor. And the benefit here is that it persists and it stays in the tumor uh, longer. And so this is a phase one, two non-randomized trial that's going on in head and neck, breast, uh, colorectal to see if this is able to um, similarly pick up lymph, you know, sentinel nodes and, and be, uh, target them better uh, than non-specific tracers that are currently used. The problem with this is uh, to create these nanoparticles, it is a complicated multi-cell process that is likely both time and cost prohibitive and, and for the most part restricted to you know, lab use at this time. <clears throat> and so going back to some clinical data, um, you know, this is the Sentinel European Node Trial, uh, which came out in 2015. And this was results of three years worth of data um, from 14 different centers with nearly 500 patients. And these are all early T1, T2 oral cavity cases and majority are oral tongue and flora mouth. And they were able to identify sentinel nodes in nearly 100% of cases. And if they identified a positive node, all patients underwent a neck dissection within three weeks. Um, they found that within this series of patients, just over 20% were positive, which is what we had talked about earlier. And the interesting thing here is that in 85% of the patients, um, there were no additional uh, nodes positive uh, when they underwent neck dissection. Um, and the false negative rate is uh, 14%. <clears throat> and if you look at the survival, um, this just shows um, as to be expected that those with positive sentinel node survival is worse, which reflects uh, and positive staging. Um, and if you look at this lower right, the number of positive nodes, they do worse, which would go which would correspond with um, N1 uh, versus, you know, or N2 versus N, N, N2A versus N2B. Um, but an interesting thing here is looking at the extent of positivity. And so in transit metastasis versus micro metastasis versus macro metastasis, these would all be uh, within the same nodal stage, though um, the survival is dramatically different. And so um, this provides additional information in terms of the prognostication for the patients that we normally don't have um, when we are doing a standard neck dissection. <clears throat> And so I highlighted some of the, the most critical data in red here. And so this is what we had talked about initially that in this group, 
70% of the patients uh, did not have to undergo an elective neck dissection because the sentinel node was negative. Now, 13% of the cohort though had an unexpected, unexpected sentinel lymph node um, drained to the contralateral neck. And in that group, 15% um, of those patients, the sentinel node was positive. And so I think this is something that always makes me take pause when I have somebody who has a, you know, a deep tumor where we are planning for an ipsilateral neck dissection or they have a N1 positive neck and, I, and we're not doing a sentinel node. And I wonder, you know, is this the patient where there could be, you know, are, they, are they part of the 15% that could have something draining on the other side? And another thing that's changed in terms of my practice is, you know, we're historically taught that a midline lesion requires a bilateral neck dissection. And so in this cohort, they did not exclude midline lesions. They injected them uh, similarly. And only 17% of the patients had to undergo an elective uh, bilateral neck dissection. And so this dramatically reduces the uh, surgical morbidity for these midline lesion patients. And so I think this is a tremendous idea for, uh, for midline lesions. Now, in terms of which subsite is the highest risk, retromolar trigone, so 33% of these patients. And so occasionally I'll have a retromolar um, trigone primary, I'll have a lymph node that's eight or nine millimeters that I don't really like how it looks on ultrasound, um, PET scan will be negative. Sometimes I'll just do an elective neck on that patient because the potential um, that that could be positive is so high. Um, compared to another subsite. And previously, you know, there was you know, data uh, saying that you know, don't ever use sentinel node biopsy on flora mouth because it has a 25% you know, false negative rate um, based on this series that has been disproven and false negatives are essentially equal for all subsites. So how else can you use this? Um, and can you use sentinel node to decide how you're going to use your radiation fields in non-operative cases. And so there's a lot of interesting data coming from the Netherlands looking at tailoring the radiation fields based on sentinel node drainage patterns. And so this suspect trial uh, looked just at this. They took T1, 2, 3 lesions uh, of the oral cavity, oral pharynx, hypopharynx, and larynx who were planning treatment with radiation or chemo radiation, and they injected the tumor uh, they did imaging at four hours, and then they looked at which patients had contralateral drainage. And 20% um, of the patients did, and these are the uh, distributions of the drainage. Now, if they did not have any contralateral drainage on the uh, sentinel node uh, injection, uh, then they get, were given a unilateral radiation plan. And so... <clears throat> You can see that 70% of this cohort was oral pharynx, so can, you can largely extrapolate it off of that. But this would be your, your standard bilateral plan. And these are the doses uh, received. A contralateral parotid gland, 35 gray. Uh, contralateral submandibular gland, 45 to 50. Um, thyroid gland, 50. Um, when you look at the single-sided plan, um, based on the sentinel node drainage, you can see that dose to the contralateral parotid, five, um, contralateral submandibular, 15, um, thyroid, 25. So, you know, greater than 50% reduction in radiation dose. <clears throat> now, the, there was a follow-up to this, which is currently ongoing. This started last year, and this is the SUSPECT-2 trial, and this takes this one step further. So it would do the injection to the same type of cohort. And if there is contralateral drainage, the patient is then taken to the OR. They're undergone sentinel lymph node biopsy. If that node is negative, uh, then even though the, they had a contralateral drainage um, with a negative node biopsy, they do not have any contralateral uh, radiation treatment. So this allows true tailoring uh, of the radiation fields, both by imaging and with tissue confirmation um, to, to further support uh, ipsilateral uh, radiation. And so this is ongoing and the primary endpoints are going to be uh, incidence of contralateral failure at one and two years with secondary endpoints of radiation related toxicity. And then also exploratory endpoint of the presence of 
uh, micro and macro metastasis in sentinel node biopsy uh, for this cohort, which hasn't been done before. And so this is another trial that just um, opened last month. And so this is, you know, the, the goal here is to put the question to rest, which is what is better, elective neck dissection or sentinel node? And uh, the primary endpoints here are disease-free survival and patient-reported uh, shoulder function with secondary endpoints of overall survival, um, local regional failure, and distant metastasis. And so the estimated enrollment here is over 600 with one-to-one -one randomization in parallel, early stage oral cavity cancer. Um, and you can see the primary completion is going to be 10 years from now with the study completion 15 years from now. So it's going to take a while to get this question answered. And so um, this would be the enrollment schema. All patients end up getting a PET CT, which is uh, essentially red. And as long as it's PET negative, then they're stratified um, into uh, arm one, which is sentinel node versus arm two, which is uh, elective neck. <coughs> and so, you know, in summary, you know, the issue we currently have is that elective neck dissection versus sentinel node biopsy, it's all retrospective data for the most part. Um, we use early stage lesions, T1, T2, and you can see that sentinel node biopsy is used for less than 5% of all patients. And so um, I think this is a very interesting and, and maybe unfortunate number uh, where a lot of patients are potentially receiving um, neck dissections who uh, really aren't benefiting from it. And you can see that a completion neck dissection can be avoided in almost 70% of the cases. And so sentinel node biopsy has reduced length of stay, has the same overall three-year survival. And you can see that typically academic centers are per, uh, performing the majority of these cases. Um, but there's limitations to all this data. So selection bias, um, issues with recurrence data in the databases, um, lack of imaging, uh, pre-op imaging data in the databases, um, and uh, training. And then also there's you know, lower reimbursement that happens with this procedure. And so um, th that is another factor that may play into it in, in some uh, practitioners. <clears throat> and so additional drawbacks, you know, there's currently no level one evidence uh, which compares sentinel node biopsy to elective neck dissection. Um, <clears throat> false negative rate is not zero. And so this is something to counsel the patients with. So even though in experienced hands, this should be around 5%, 50% um, of those failures are not salvageable. Um, and so in a perfect world, you'd have real time uh, intraoperative determination if it's positive. And so there are some investigational studies using real-time quantitative PCR that take 30 minutes. And then you would use that information to decide at that moment if they're going to have a neck dissection and that would spare the second round of anesthesia. And so, you know, another uh, limitation is that there's multiple drainage pathways and multiple sentinel nodes. And so um, if you look at the regional failure rate after neck di after ipsilateral neck dissection, it's typically 20%. Um, but almost half of those failures are going to be contralateral. So uh, this is just another uh, argument that we need to pay more attention to the complexity of the drainage pathways in the head and neck. And just because something appears to be on one side, um, there is the real risk that there is contralateral drainage. Um, so in conclusion, um, sentinel node biopsy, it's a safe means for assessing a clinically occult a regional metastasis in appropriately selected oral, uh, early stage oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma patients. And like I said, my name is Chris Vondokowski. I'm happy to answer any questions. And this is my cell phone. This is my email if um, I can ever be a help. Thank you, doctor. We have some, some questions. Thank you for the very interesting talk. The first question that I have in here is, uh, for a DOI larger than one centimeter, should it be, should a, um, I forget the word, should a biopsy be done? So depth of invasion greater than 10 millimeter? One centimeters. Yeah, so, so one centimeter or 10 millimeter, typically not because oh, that's going to be a, Typically, I would say not because that's going to be a T3 lesion and the likelihood of that being positive is, is going to be approaching greater than a third. And so those patients typically are fair better with upfront elective neck dissection. Okay, okay. 
Thank you, doctor. Um, doctor Parales, the, doctor. Yeah, the, the, the sweet spot for, for this type of patient ends up being around six millimeters. That's kind of the ideal patient. Okay. Um, Alguien más tiene alguna otra pregunta? Does anybody have any other question? I think you have a very interesting conference, Doc. Everything seems to be very clear. Dr. Parales, um, we have any other question? Dr. Alberne? No, oh, everything is very clear. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. Very good conference. Todo muy claro, muy completo el protocolo. Este protocolo de abordaje, doctor Christopher, eh, se aplica a cualquier cáncer de cavidad oral, de hipofaringe también, de la hipofaringe, cáncer de hipofaringe. So for uh, hypopharyngeal cancer, do you apply the same protocol? For surgical treatment versus or non-surgical. El abordaje de Sí, no, en general, para el diagnóstico. Estamos en fase de For, cuando detecta la masa y encuentra adenopatías en, la, en, la ima, en una imagen, en la resonancia, necesitas hacerle, o sea, mejor dicho, la duda mía es porque tenemos un PET scan en nuestro centro y la verdad yo no lo vengo utilizando mucho. No tengo tanta experiencia en cáncer como la doctora Ovirne o como el doctor Christopher. Eh, y se nos presentó un caso en estos días, de un paciente con una asimetría en la base de la lengua. Eh, yo recibí el paciente para biopsia. Eh, como había cierta presión de la familia para hacer la biopsia, no hicimos estudios adicionales, sino que hice la biopsia y la biopsia se dio negativa para cualquier lesión tumoral. O sea, fue una lesión liquenoide y más nada. Eh, normalmente, uno podría, previo a tomar biopsias, hacer algún otro estudio diagnóstico no invasivo para no pues. so so his question is um he had a he had a patient with a with a node in the base of the tongue so um the the family was kind of pressuring to do a biopsy so they did the biopsy but at the end um they it, it was it was not cancer so can you use this protocol that you explained to be able to detect this type of patients to kind of um, detect whether they're, they have cancer or not? Uh, or are there any other options besides a CT scan? To see if the, the mass in the tongue base was cancer? Yeah. I don't no. know if I understand the, the no. question exactly. So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I translated it wrong. So why don't we do this? Um, can you repeat the question, Dr. Parales? Bueno, Because... Más concretamente. Yeah. Cuando tú, tú encuentras una, una masa en hipofaringe en base de lengua y eh, sospecha que es un cáncer, antes de hacer la biopsia, ¿podrías hacer algún estudio eh, no invasivo? When you, found, when you find a mass. Es tan, o sea, no. diferente a resonancia... O sea, algo más específico que una resonancia o que una tomografía con, con, contrastada, pero estaba viendo que el protocolo incluye unas marcaciones con PET, eh, con escintigrafía. So, whenever you find a, a mass in the base of the tongue, um, are there any other options besides the biopsy, biopsy and the PET scan to, to diagnose whether it's cancer or not? I would say at least for for where I am in the base of the tongue, you know, seventy five percent are HPV associated, and so the majority have some type of a neck mass. And so I would say the majority of the tongue base that I see, I diagnosed in the office with a needle biopsy. Um, and so if you can get that ahead of time, that's always beneficial because a lot of times you can't get a PET scan approved without a biopsy. Um, so I'd say the majority of the tongue bases I see, I do it with the needle first. But if they're N0, um, then you really have no way to diagnose it unless you're, you're biopsying it. I typically don't use MRI ever except for parapharyngeal tumors. 
because the motion artifact with swallowing is too great. Um, and so I would say in terms of determining malignancy, uh, if, if available, it's easier to do it with the neck. Um, but in the cases that don't have it, that's all you have. And then as far as, I think you said hypopharyngeal, you said that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, um, say lingua. yeah so okay. base of the tongue, yeah. But as far as hypopharynx, that ends up being kind of a different animal because those are so aggressive. And typically even like a T2, you treat those like stage threes and fours and they commonly get concurrent chemo RT uh, because the survival is so terrible. And the issue is the, the nodal drainage pathways are so different. And so you get lateral neck, plus you get retropharyngeal, plus you get paratracheal. And so a lot of times the extent of surgery ends up being bilateral. Um, and so you have to almost have the perfect patient where I think surgery ends up being better. So I would say I, very, it's very uncommon that I find a really good operative case for hypopharynx. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. I have another question over here. Do you re-inject patients the same the same day if performing a sentinel lymph node, or the day before? Or have you seen any difference for the performance of the technique? No. If if you do the day before, you need to increase the dose. So typically two millicurie the day before, one millicurie the day of. Uh, I try to do it the day of just because the patients don't like to come to the hospital twice. But if you know, the nuclear medicine people can't fit them in, um, then there is no difference in doing it the day before if the dose is higher. Okay, thank you. For cases for T1 in uh, oral cavity that look like adenopathies, um, Immediately posterior to the to the to the uh, surgical procedure, and that had a stud previous studies of the use of Jesus. Give me one second. Um, I need to translate this. I am not a physician. I'm having a hard time with this one. Doctor, can you see the question? It is in the um, Q and A section over there. Oh, but it's in Spanish. Uh, okay, so let me see. Um, da, 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 da. So for cases of T1 in, in oral cavity that look like adenopathies, mm -hmm. after the surgical procedure and had previous studies, um, like the USG in head, in, in the neck, and RMN in neck normal, and then they are painful, how can that invade, how fast can that invade the lymphatic um, system? Or if they if they hide from it, uh, from expressing? So you're saying a case where you did a sentinel node biopsy, it was negative, and then they developed a mass afterwards? E, I think, yes. Saying? Yes, I think it is. Give me one second, because... I am, um, this, this one, this one is a good one and I don't want to make a mistake over here. Um, let me do this. Lobo, can you, uh, Mr. Um, Eduardo, Lalo, me, me puede ayudar a, a traducir esta en el canal de inglés? La pregunta que está en, en el, en el, en el módulo de preguntas y respuestas. A ver si se nos queme por ahí. So, four cases. But this might be posterior. Let me see. I'm going to do the translation again. So, let's see if I can do it better. In cases of T1 in oral cavity that look and that appear as adenopathies immediately posterior to the uh, surgical procedure and had previous studies um, in the neck and that are painful. How fast can they, yes. So it's probably that how fast can they hide and if they hide, how fast can they go to to, uh, to the lymph nodes? No, 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 the, the case is oh, no? like, 
Oh yeah, you thank you very much. <laughs> they have a negative uh, images, previews of the surgery. And immediately, immediately, I don't know how many hours or days, but immediately after the surgery, the patient has uh, painful adenopathies. Mm. Do you think that fast can the lymphatic system could be invaded or they were occult adenopathies that express immediately after the surgery? Yeah, I would say there wouldn't be, the surgery wouldn't really um, change anything. You know, I, I, you commonly hear this question where if you make an incision and you take a lymph node out, do things begin to spread? Um, I think in the context of excisional node biopsies on squamous cells, you know, lymph nodes, you're not supposed to do that. Um, and so that can definitely cause seeding of the skin and things like that. But in the situation where you have a negative CAT scan or negative pre-op imaging, you do the sentinel node biopsy. Um, I haven't seen a situation when something emerges dramatically like that. And typically, um, you know, nodal disease isn't painful like that. So I would say I don't have a, I wouldn't be able to comment from experience on seeing something like that. Um, you know, usually you know, the, in terms of the doubling time for tumors like this, it ends up being under two months. So I think if you did have some rare situation when that, you know, something like this did happen um, and it was in the office, I would needle biopsy it. If it is positive, they would get a neck dissection. But I think that would be a really, you know, exceptionally rare sort of situation. You would think that whatever lymph node that emerged would have drained from the biopsy or from the injection. But say, for example, that it was missed on the imaging and it was uh, to a different basin then, and it emerged, you know, then it, I would work it up like a new one. If it was positive, then they would need the, the surgery. Thank you, doctor. And thank you, doctor. Um, I think we don't have any other questions. And uh, for everybody's uh, respect of their time, um, I think we're going to start to to close. I just want to share something real quick with you guys right here. So um, Dr. Fondakowski just shared with you his email, but um, if you have any, um, do you want any more information? Do you want to discuss with us any opportunities for academic cooperation or to refer a patient, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, Dr. Fundakowski. Thank you, Dr. Wiernem. Thank you, Dr. Parales. And thank you, everybody. It's been a fantastic opportunity for us. It's been a pleasure for me to be able to, to have the, the opportunity to share this space with, with such great physicians. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure this is not going to be the last of our interactions. We are looking forward to develop a, a long lasting relationship with all of you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you very much.